Hey, happy Aloha Friday, everybody. I'm Stan Osterman, Stan, the energy man from Hawaii. Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. That's a mouthful, so we just say HCAT. But thanks to, uh, thanks to all of you for coming to our show on your lunch hour, and uh, we appreciate you being here. We're going to talk about some, uh, some energy as it relates to the legislature and laws and what we're trying to do with the, the government in Hawaii to, to make energy, uh, renewable energy in particular. Um, a reality here in Hawaii. So we have a, a special guest today from the legislature, uh, Representative, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screw this up, I just know it, Keo Kaloli. Am I yeah, close? Keo Kaloli, okay, yeah. from uh, the legislature. Jarrett's here and he's going to talk to us. Uh, he's from the House of Representatives from uh, next door to Chris uh, Lee in the windward side over in what, Kahalu. Yeah, Kaneohe, Kahalu, okay. and Waiahole. And so we're going to talk all things energy and uh, We'll get started with, why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got interested in doing energy things, because that's how I know you from doing energy stuff. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Sure. Appreciate the invitation. Um, I, yeah, so I represent Kaneohe, Kahalu'u, and Waiahole in the State House. I am from there, and I actually got interested in energy issues when I was in college. I went to UH Manoa from 2001 to 2006, and then... And then thereafter, and then I went to law school. I hung around there probably 10 years. Do your parents years. know you were going to hang around UH that long? Well, yeah, because I wasn't hanging around at home. Okay. And so I think they were okay with it. <laughs> but so I found out about uh, actually hydrogen technology while I was an undergrad in the early 2000, 2003 or 2004, I think. And someone introduced me to the concept of fuel cells, which I thought was really interesting, you know, um, I don't know if you've talked about fuel cell technology, but basically it's, you know, you take hydrogen and, and they run it into the engine just like you do gasoline and, and it emits water. And so at the time, the idea of being able to run your car on an engine that emits water instead of, you know, um, carbon was really interesting. And it's something that I always have sort of followed since then. And then when I got into the legislature, I think I met you during the High Tech Development Corp tour mm -hmm. and we came to the facility and uh, got to learn about what's going on with hydrogen development in Hawaii. And I think at the time, well, when I went to the visit, it was something that I immediately thought should be included in the discussion of renewable energy development um, for our state, not only for electricity production, but especially for transportation. There's been a lot of discussion I've seen over the last several years uh, regarding, you know, electricity, solar, you know, people powering their homes through rooftop solar. And so I thought one aspect of, of renewable energy, the renewable energy discussion that maybe hasn't been getting as much attention was um, the fact that we run all of our cars on fossil fuels. Yeah, we've been getting you know. a D minus from Blue Planet on transportation. Oh, yeah. Because we haven't been catching up and doing as good as the solar. Well, you know, and then Hawaii, I think Hawaii culture is very much so a car culture. I, I've lived on the mainland, I lived in New York for a couple of years. Definitely, uh, New York City is definitely a walking city. Uh, we never had a car there. In Hawaii, I think it's four cars per household. <laughs> you know, so um, if we really want to make a dent and, and in, in our consumption of fossil fuels and really try and hit the goals that we've, the ambitious goals we've set for ourselves, which I don't think are impossible, you know, we definitely need to be looking at all of the emissions that we release uh, into our environment from our cars. Okay. And, and so that's sort of how I got interested in it and, and why I'm continuing to be interested in it mm -hmm. uh, in the legislature. So, so in the legislature, though, but you're in finance, right? The finance yeah. committee? Is that the only committee you sit on right now? I sit on, well, actually, I sit on the transportation committee. On oh, the transportation uh, committee. And the labor committee and also public safety, okay. which is, uh, you know, prisons, jails, and... Um, and the, the police department, okay. among other things. But, you know, so there are definitely implications uh, when it comes to our state budget mm -hmm. and, and the finance committee. But, you know, we deal with transportation issues every day during the session on the, on the House Transportation Committee. And so I thought that I was in a, a good position to explore renewable energy development from that angle. Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about the economic part of, of what we're dealing with with fossil fuels. Because... You know, as I mentioned to you before the show, um, a lot of folks talk about the clean and green and our environmental consciousness here in Hawaii and, 
and wanting to, to uh, be good to the land and, and the ocean. And, and that's all really important. But the other impact that's really not looked at a lot is the financial impact to Hawaii when we keep importing so much. And that includes food and everything else, but especially energy. Our energy that we import for our electric and for our fuels for our vehicles has a huge economic impact. You know, how does the, the legislature look at, at that economic impact and what is their feeling on it? Well, for me, when it comes to renewable energy development, I think that is one of, if not the most important consideration. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the big issues that I talked about when I ran for office last year is the cost of living situation we have in Hawaii and how difficult it is. You know, a lot of that has to do with the cost of housing and your electric bill, you know, at home is a major factor in that. But also, um, you know, whether you own a home or rent a home or you're living with your family, um, you need to travel. And so the cost of a vehicle is another major factor. Um, and, you know, the cost of cars and the cost of insurance are not things that we can necessarily control at the legislature. But if we can move people to more renewable sources, which mm -hmm. in the long run can bring down the cost of transportation while also helping us hit our renewable energy goals, I think is a you know, win-win and something yeah, that we and need to continue to, to, to discuss. And the same rules apply from from a household to a business. You know, running a business takes energy and power and transportation. So the same things you're talking about for a household that impacts a household negatively makes it more expensive to live here, makes it more expensive for businesses to do business here when they're paying a lot for their power and they're paying a lot for their transportation to get their goods to market, to move things from the docks to their store, to move things from their store to or warehouse to their store. You know, all those things that add up and have an economic impact. and a negative one for revenues even, for tax revenues, because if we're sending all that money out of the state, then that's, that's less jobs and less, and less movement of that capital through your economy locally and less revenue for the government to work with as well. Well, I think that's something that people also, it's a good point. It, you know, one of the parts of this that I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about when you're talking about renewable energy, even when you're, when you're talking about electric vehicles and, and um, renewable transportation options is the fact that um, when you drive on H3, I'm from Kaneohe, so that, that's where we get the big trucks, but when you live on the west side and you drive and you see all those giant semis, you know, and then they have the, the exhaust on the top and they, you know, every now and then they puff out a, a, a little mm -hmm. plume of diesel smoke. Like, if we can get those vehicles on renewable energy sources, that takes a huge dent out of our, out of our carbon emissions and if we can do it cheaply for those businesses, it helps, it helps our community overall because they can bring their costs down and hopefully that sort of uh, uh, matriculates throughout the system. Well, I've been working a lot with, uh, in fact, our guest last week was Paul Pontio from Blue Planet on the Big Island Blue Planet Research side. And he and I have a mutual um, mentor and friend in Phoenix, Arizona named Roy McAllister. I'm going to go visit Roy in November. And he's actually got some technology where he retrofits diesel trucks with direct inject hydrogen and direct inject um, other more carbon friendly fuels um, and actually is able to convert those big trucks to run a lot cleaner with a, a relatively quick uh, conversion, less than a one day conversion. And then the trucks run a lot cleaner. So that's something that, that actually I'm looking at from the HCAT side to bring back here to Hawaii and make sure that we look at that as one of the things to solve the problem you just talked about. And that's one of the neat things that I get to do is I get to work with uh, the Air Force on their projects and Blue Planet Research on their projects and, and Mitch Ewan up at HNEI with the things that, that the university is doing. I also work a little bit with Office of Naval Research and the Energy Accelerator with um, Don Lippert. And we network a lot and talk about the technologies that are out there that we should be using for Hawaii. One of the things that kind of, I think, frustrates me personally a little bit, though, is, you know, we've always seen the, the grid is the grid and transportation is transportation. But when we started plugging in cars, that relationship got a little bit different. Now the energy you're using in your car is coming from the grid. And the grid isn't necessarily clean all the time. So it's important that the grid be clean for that transportation piece. But now we also have the fact that batteries in those cars are able to store energy on the grid when they're plugged to the grid. 
And then you talked about hydrogen. You get hydrogen vehicles. If the, if the electric company could use um, their excess power that people with PV on the roof or commercial PV are making too much electricity, if the power company could make hydrogen and store it, then the, then the energy would be right where they need it out in the communities when it comes nighttime and they need more energy back in their grid. They take that stored hydrogen plus some of the batteries that we've talked about and put the energy right back in the grid out where it's needed, out in the community, rather than push it through a line all the way from Kahi Power Plant all the way to Kahalu. So we want to try and encourage HECO to do things like that, but HECO's an, an old company, an established company, and they do a great job of delivering good, clean power to the citizens of this island and throughout the state on the neighbor islands, except Kauai, who has their own. And, um, you know, they take a lot of pride in, in the quality of their work, but it's a little frustrating to see that, that I don't know that I've seen a real vision from them, especially as we go into this Nextera thing, um, a vision from either Nextera or HECO of what it's gonna look like 10 years from now. How will HECO help um, with distributed generation and how will they help us with transportation, um, with our problem and transportation getting it cleaner by making it um, more, more renewables on their system um, as we try and hit that 2045 goal the governor put out there. How do we do all that? You would expect that the big utilities, the PUC and the electric company and maybe even Hawaii Gas would help have a big, a big solution for us to consider five years from now or 10 years from now. Uh, how, what do you think about that kind of stuff? Um, uh, did I take all the... <laughs> that was a lot. Yeah, you threw Sorry. a table there. Good thing we got a big table. Uh, I talk a lot. Well, these are good, uh, you know, it's, it's a good question. I think there are multiple parts to that that I want to hit. Uh, so we'll start with the batteries. You know, there's been a lot of attention put on battery storage. And I think that there are opportunities and then there are also concerns to, to the, the notion of having a, a, lot of, a lot of folks out in, uh, in our neighborhoods just unplugged from the grid. Because not everybody has the, word, the means and the ability to, to go and purchase these battery systems mm -hmm. and purchase these, these solar uh, arrays and, and, and put them on their homes and, and then just unplug. Some people, like me, rent. And, and it's a challenge yeah, to, yeah. to be able to utilize that technology. Where you live but in a I condo. Think, right. And uh, so it's something to keep in mind. And so the way I've tried to approach it, when you talk about these complex energy issues, is you know, at a minimum, we want to make sure that we're maintaining a balance between the different policy aims that we have. So one of them is hitting our renewable energy goals. You know, it was a big, I think it was a really big deal that we set these targets and, and made these commitments um, to live a, a cleaner, greener lifestyle in Hawaii. And it starts with, you know, our energy consumption. But I also think we, we really need to make sure that we're remembering the bottom line for for residents, and that bottom line is we need we need cheap energy. It's really expensive to live in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and a, a big part of that is the energy costs that we have: gas for our cars and electricity for our homes, which are also run off of fossil fuels. And so, when we're talking about ideas uh, and and technologies that we need to pursue to help us get there. Um, we need to keep as many options on the table as possible because I think when you have big decisions that you have to make, um, big policy decisions that you have to make, whether you're the PUC or whether it's us at the legislature, the more options you have, the better. Okay. Because you can compare, you can really, you can, and, it, and it allows opportunities to make sure that um, residents are getting the best bang for their buck and, and getting the best deals. So when it comes to HECO and Nextera, you know, part of our role at the legislature is making sure that the PUC is capable of providing oversight, which has been a challenge in the past. Making sure that, that those guys are, are properly resourced so that they can go in and scrutinize what HECO's doing, for instance, with, um, with uh, the permitting of, of mm -hmm. rooftop solar in different neighborhoods, uh, so that they can properly scrutinize this next era proposal and so that they can properly vet other ideas like utility ideas or or uh, you know even the the I guess evolving commitments that next era is making um, moving forward so well, I tell you what we're up on a break time 
And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a chance to catch your breath because I, I rattled on and probably should have done that after the break to let you get on a good roll here. But um, we'll come back in 60 seconds and we'll talk more about that. Thanks. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock. And of course, you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an arts show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with uh, artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, but, uh, actors, of course. And we don't on only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. E, welcome back to my lunch hour. We've got, we've got our local rep from Kahalu Kanioi, Jarrett. Keoho Ko Kalole. I'm, get, I'm getting it. it. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying really hard. I don't know why I have such a brain cramp on it, rep, but, but I've been working. You can ask my office. I just practice your name like all morning long, and I, I just, I don't know what it is. It's intimidating. But, it took me a while. Okay, well, that's good to know. That's good to know if it took you a while. But, that was five. But, yeah. <laughs> mine's not that easy, but it's a lot easier than yours. Yeah. Anyway, we, we talked a little bit about the strategic plan for the state and how we have to keep a lot of options on the table and the role of the PUC and kind of vetting through all those. And it's, it's a pretty daunting challenge. I mean, I know because I, I deal with new technology every day. I mean, literally, week by week, I see new technology come in. And, and it's hard for a, a public utilities commission or even a utility to keep up with all that because they have to put it in context of a huge scale. I mean, we're not talking a household. We're talking... A huge grid that covers millions, you know, millions of people, 1.4 million people in the state, and so each county has, you know, quite a few uh, customers that they've got to react to and have a system to take care of. But let's let's get hypothetical for us for a second and say, what if we could divide the grid up a little bit, and say we had schools out there that were shelters that that are designated shelters because we know that Hawaii is prone to everything from tsunamis and earthquakes to hurricanes. And if we could take some of our schools that were out in the grid and kind of design that neighborhood so that all the photovoltaics on the school and in the neighborhood could make, you know, whatever energy would be needed for a, a localized, I wouldn't call it a microgrid, but a, a localized community, maybe a circuit in Hiko's area. But we could use any extra electricity to make some hydrogen, put it in some storage, and have a fuel cell out in there to make electricity back from the hydrogen and put it back in the grid. And if we had a system like that, that would be really good for resiliency after disaster because these schools, it would not only be good for the schools because they have a good source of uh, relatively inexpensive electricity to run every day, they'd also have um, the ability to take care of their community during a disaster. So is that kind of rattling around anywhere in, uh, in the legislature area? Have you done any trips to see what the impact of something like that would be? What's rattling around my head right now <laughs> is a good idea. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's a great discussion that we should and, and probably will have in the legislature this coming year, especially given the summer that we, that we just had with all these hurricanes and the El Nino year, you know, making sure that we uh, have good plans in place to deal with natural disasters is one of our primary functions, you know, in the legislature. And, you know, there are so many opportunities with the schools that I think we, we could take advantage of and we need to take advantage of. And having, you know, having hydrogen uh, placed in schools is beneficial for a number of reasons. One is, is uh, the second part that you talked about, which is, you know, it's, it's a cheap, relatively clean alternative or auxiliary power source that we, ha we can have for the schools in the schools. That's, why I su that's another reason why I support um, accelerating the process to get solar panels on the schools, because not only is it going to bring down the energy uh, It'll cool the, the classroom costs. ahead of time, I mean, besides. Right, it, it, yeah. <laughs> right. And not only is it going to shade the roof, but, you know, it's going to bring down the energy costs. And it's efficient because 
you know, the schools are going to be using that, that power that they generate on, on their solar rooftops at the times when the sun is brightest and, and the solar panels are, are providing the most amount of energy. So it's really efficient. You know, when you talk about air conditions in schools, it's something like $50 million a year worth of electric costs mm -hmm. that are going to go into that. So, you know, having rooftop solar on schools where, you, where you're running on, consuming a lot of power at the time the, the solar energy is, is providing the most power is just a, re just a really uh, makes logical sense. thing. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and so the same thing with providing secondary or even primary power sources to the evacuation centers, which for the most part are schools. So uh, on the finance committee, we've been doing site visits around the state to see you know, where the needs are and, and what our priorities are going to be for the budget the next year. And you know, we were just talking, one of the trips we made uh, last week was to Maui, and we drove out to Hana and visited the school. You know, it's two hours out uh, to Hana High School, and they support the community all the way along the coast, not only the two hours to Hana, but all the way around to Kaupo and Kipahulu. You know, so four hours worth of, worth of drive time and communities are supported by you know, the facilities and the infrastructure in Hana. And the Hana High School Gymnasium just, uh, just installed a brand new beautiful basketball court in their gymnasium which also serves as their evacuation center and when we went and visited there one of the first things the students that we met with brought up was the fact that there's a giant hole in the roof in the Hana High School gymnasium and so not only is it you know going to if they catch a, another big rain and, uh, and we hit you know we get another big storm not only is it going to damage the brand new floor but it's also their evacuation center and so you know being able to, to sort of retrofit and upgrade and maintain our, our schools, not only because that's where our kids go, that's where the education is done, but also because they are a lot of times community centers and also you know, parts, of our, um, parts of our natural disaster infrastructure and evacuation centers is really important. So Especially in places like Hana. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, fixing the roof first and then, but the idea of putting in, you know, um, hydrogen energy storage at, an, at a school like Hana in an isolated community and being able to provide those folks power if there's an extended amount of time where the trees are down blocking the roads and, and services can't get out to them, I think is crucial for lots of communities, but it really... Um, it really makes a lot of sense, and that's, a, that's an, a visual that's very easy to understand when you talk about an isolated community like Hong Yeah, and you know what I, I learned in one of the last disasters of being a National Guard guy was that when Hana had, uh, was cut off um, from a storm, um, they needed propane. Propane was one of the things they really needed because they're so isolated that they actually are almost off the grid themselves. A lot of the houses use propane for their refrigeration, for, for other things besides grilling and, and doing things cooking. Um, so you could actually incorporate a, a holistic approach to a community like that, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, and make their whole community basically be able to be hooked to the grid or be able to isolate themselves and take care of themselves with just solar arrays and making some hydrogen. A lot of people don't think about it. I mean, I'm, I'm into the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle things, but hydrogen, you can cook with it. Um, we went to Paul Pontio's place on the Big Island a couple weeks ago with some uh, government reps, and Paul actually cooked our lunch on a grill that was powered by hydrogen. And it was kind of cool to watch him sitting there doing stir fry, you know, on a hydrogen uh, grill. It's, it's easy. You can actually just use it as a gas to cook with or put it in your fuel cells or generate electricity with it. So it's kind of neat. But it gives you that survivable, you know, piece that, that um, communities like Hana, uh, remote communities that really need during a disaster, after a disaster to help recover. And as you said, you know, we're used to a storm that comes in and knocks out a few power lines. But what would happen if somebody did a cyber attack on HECO and took out, maybe oversped all their turbines and we didn't have power on Oahu for like three months or four months because they had to bring in large equipment to take care of the power requirements. You know, wow, the impact of something like that is uh, catastrophic. And I know that a lot of the utilities on the mainland are, are scared to death of a cyber attack because of the damage it can cause, the physical damage it can cause to their equipment that would take them more than just a couple of days or weeks to recover, but you know maybe months to recover from. So, 
I think, like you mentioned, we've got to put a lot of options on the table, but we have to have a, a pretty good strategic look at how it all fits together. Because before you go and put solar on a roof, the roof's got to be able to take the solar, and you, you don't want to put solar on a roof and have the roof collapse, or you, know, you have to look at all those things. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us, and I'm glad that we got somebody like you uh, in the legislature helping us work through those issues with all the different departments. And um, I'm hoping, at least from my perspective as a state guy and you as a legislator, that, that we can help uh, companies and folks that have the, the, the will and the means of doing the improvements that we're asking, and even if we're paying them. But we have, we have the expertise that we can get them going and that they will make these changes and make a good solid plan for why. There's a lot of interest out there in the community to do it and do it right, but it takes good planning. And well, that's put. You know, and that's where we come into it. It's our job to make sure that we're communicating to the, to our communities and our constituents, um, and and making sure they understand what the priorities are and why they're, you know, they are the priorities that they are. And so, for instance, when it comes to hydrogen, you know, I think that there is a lot of room for for um, communication on hydrogen and hydrogen storage and and fuel cell development out to the communities. You know, when a lot of people think of hydrogen, they think of the Hindenburg. Exactly. And that is not the, that's just not the case anymore. You know, hydrogen is a relatively safe fuel. You know, gasoline is incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly flammable. And, and you know, hydrogen is a safe source of, of um, clean energy. You know, batteries, um, cause all sorts of environmental impacts in their production. And so this is just one of the cleaner um, sources of, of renewable energy technology that we want to put on the table and continue to, to make sure is being a part of the discussion. That's part of the reason why, you know, I've come on the show, I've talked about hydrogen, uh, and, and, you know, that's one of the big reasons why um, we did the bill, you know, in the, in the last legislative session designating you as the the state hydrogen implementation. Thank you, by the way. Yeah, you're welcome. And it, it's because we want to keep the discussion going and make sure people understand that, you know, when we're talking about energy independence or self-sufficiency or just making sure we have good disaster planning and, and good access to, to secondary sources of energy, that hydrogen is one of the options that we should have on the table. And you know, whether it's the best option or whether it should be included in, a, in an array of different, you know, energy generation sources are, you know, discussions that we need to have. I'm not, I'm not necessarily advocating for one over the other or, or any of the others. It's just we have lots of options. And I think we're in a really exciting time when it comes to renewable gener uh, energy generation. You know, we talked about earlier... Um, what history has taught us is that the, when we have new technology, the industry that sprouts up from that technology usually happens in the place where the inventor lives. You know, uh, when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, all of the electric industry built up around his hometown because that's where he was from. And so we have a lot of opportunity to do renewable energy research and development in Hawaii, whether it's hydrogen, um, wind, ocean, you know, we have all of these different opportunities. And I really do think in the next three to five years, uh, we could see some really significant technological advances when it comes to renewable energy development and storage. We're already seeing some with, with batteries, uh, you know, as an example. But we need to keep our eyes open. And, you know, like you said before, we need to make sure we're keeping uh, these issues in front of us so that we're able to adapt if good technology comes online. But we're also able to foster, um, you know, that, that ecosystem of, of you know, that, renewable a, and green energy development. That's a good point. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to talk about how the rep and I are going to help foster that forward movement in renewable energy. See Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. 
Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Well, welcome back to My Aloha Friday and My Lunch Hour. Stan, the energy man. We're uh, glad to be here with Rep. Ke oho, ke... Oh, God, I'm going to... Go ke oho, ke oho, ke <laughs> I'm getting worse. I started yeah, off so well, now I'm going oh, downhill really quick. I'm telling you, it's intimidating. You're, you're an imposing figure, and you scare the daylights out of me. But <laughs> glad to have you here, Rep. And... Um, what we really want to talk about right now is what can we do, what state guys can do to help private sector and help folks that have the right, the right plan, the right effort going to help our communities in things like permitting, um, to get building permits with the counties and to, to pass all the safety you know, wickets that they got to go through. I mean, I'm a licensed contractor in cabinet and millwork and you know, if you're not used to doing it, just getting a building permit to do a remodeling job can be really daunting. And to build a house or a, especially a big building, I mean, you have a whole team of folks just working on the permitting. You know, how do we deal with things like that within our own system, within our state system, to maybe help streamline some of the new technologies we want to bring on board? What are the things that guys like I can do to, like, maybe educate people? Or what's the best way for me to educate the folks that issue permits and stuff to, to let it help them understand that this isn't the Hindenburg and it isn't H bombs. It's this is hydrogen and this is what it's all about. Do I need to write a book or something, or what do I what do I do, Don? Uh, maybe you should write a book. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is one. This is one. Uh, I think of of the really good effective techniques to doing it. Is it really does just take general education. I think our communities need to be better informed that these types of options and opportunities exist. And then you're right, the people in the offices, um, you know, the administrators, the, and, and then the staffers, the office ladies, and, and people that, um, that are working in the, you know, even the janitors should know what these sorts of ideas are because it affects everybody. And, um, you know, that's, that's one of the ways that we can definitely uh, play a part in the process. It, Permitting is difficult. Regulations oftentimes are, are a difficult um, system to maneuver. And, you know, part of the discussions that I think we need to have going forward is, you know, can we manipulate these processes to make sure that they're doing what they intended, but also to, to make sure we're not picking winners and losers right. just through the, the, the bureaucracy. We're shortcutting of, safety issues, exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and Part of that just happens through discussions with people that are, that are you know, doing the work um, out in the field, but also the folks that are in charge of these processes. You know, a lot of people, um, well, one thing I learned, you know, in the year that I've been in the legislature is that sometimes working groups and task forces are not as bad as people make them out to be. Um, a lot of times people think, you know, just in general, every time the legislature creates a task force or a work group, it's because they're kicking the can down the road on some issue that they don't want to really decide. Okay. I'm not going to argue whether that happens or not, but sometimes they are just created because there are opportunities to bring in people who don't have exposure to the types of knowledge or experiences of, of people out in the field, people like you who are doing this type of research and implementation, and just letting people talk. Uh, so that there's a better understanding of what's going on and what everyone's roles are. And oftentimes those are very effective ways to, to move policy forward. You know, a lot of the issue, initiatives and policies that, that we see currently, you know, our renewable energy targets started because there was a work, work group somewhere at some point that got together and said, what's the best way to get us carbon free, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, it, it takes a period of time sometimes when there's new technology that people are unfamiliar with. You know, particularly with concepts like hydrogen where, you know, we haven't really, I, I think maybe, uh, you know, in our culture, uh, in America and in Hawaii, we probably haven't had a seri serious significant discussion about the merits and, and downsides of hydrogen since, you know, the hydrogen bomb. And so that's 50, 60 years of, of lapse before we, we renew the discussion. And so there's a process that needs to take place. And we as legislators can help facilitate that. And that's part of the reason why I'm here. 
Well, when I, I, I get to partner with all kinds of folks, and one of the states that I work closely with is California, because California has a very aggressive hydrogen program. And one of the things that they have that I really admire, and I don't think we can do it here easily, but it'd be worth looking at, is they have one man that's in the, uh, his name is Tyson, and he's in the governor's office, and all he does is hydrogen. And because they have a mandate to put 100 hydrogen stations throughout California to support their vehicle infrastructure, and this, the state puts in $20 million a year to build new stations with public-private partnerships to get the infrastructure going. And Tyson's job in the governor's office is just when something gets stuck somewhere in some fire, uh, fire uh, chief's office or the, the fire inspector who's got to put a stamp on it, is he picks up the phone and goes, hey, this is uh, Tyson from Governor Brown's office, and, uh, you know, we, we've got this project we're working on, a new hydrogen station out there. How's it going? You, you, you know, is it going good? Are you any questions? If you do, we have these guys over here that are experts in the fire safety piece, and we'll be glad to connect them with you. Oh, okay, thanks. Click. And then things get moving again. And uh, it's nice to have, like, a one belly button somewhere in the, in the executive branch, someplace, or maybe in Department of Transportation, or maybe, I mean, pick a place, pick at the PUC, whatever, where they have the ear of senior um, executive branch folks that can just drop the hint that maybe, you know, hey, we are watching these projects, and, and the contractors are all calling us going, it ain't happening, we're, this is the no month number four, and we're still waiting for stuff. In the meantime, you know, time's going by and I'm renting equipment and, you know, can we get it moving? And there's, there's one belly button in California that gets things moving. Can we do something like that in Hawaii? Is that reasonable or is that, is that probably? I think that's you. Is that me? I can go ask the governor <laughs> if he's got an Will the governor answer office. my call? He'll yeah, answer. I, okay. If the governor will answer my phone call, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, you know, um, that's a good question. And that shows sort of priorities when it comes to... California and what people are doing in, in other places you know um, I didn't I didn't think of that idea when when we did the the hydrogen implementation coordinator bill but um, you know that basically comes down to resource allocation you know and that comes as a part of a broader discussion of how you know, how are we, we've made this commitment to renewable energy. How are we going to implement this plan? You know, and what are the resources that we're going to devote to it? Um, and uh, moving forward, what is, what is it going to take to move the needle? You know, I think when it comes to our specific state processes and the different things that we can do to help move, you know, good ideas and good policies forward, um, it's still going to take that kind of coordination, mm -hmm. you know. It's still going to take uh, phone calls and getting people who might not be familiar with these issues out to see. And I'm a big believer of, of, of having people go out and see the technology and see how it can be implemented so that you can really understand what's going on. It, it would not have been as effective to have the principal of Hana High School come to Oahu come to the state legislature finance committee hearing room and say we have a hole in our gymnasium roof we need money to fix it it was much more uh, to me helpful to actually have us go in and visit the campus and drive out to Hana and understand how important it is to have a proper evacuation facility in that community and and understand that that evacuation facility as it stands right now is not effective you know and so that's part of the discussion and the process that we're going to have to have moving forward when it comes to all types of renewable energy technology and then in particular hydrogen. Like I said, that's a discussion that that needs to continue to happen. And there's a lot of educate, a lot of room for more education in the general public and with the people you know throughout the government, not only the state but the counties, you know, even even our federal agencies and partners, because everybody has a role to play. Well, we've got a lot going on in the state right now, I know, and, and I'm kind of, I wish I could talk more about it, but we have uh, some great conversations ongoing with the State Department of Transportation, with the Foreign Trade Zone, you know, with a lot of folks that are interested in hydrogen and interested in um, storing renewable energy uh, so that they can, they can actually survive on their own if they have to uh, and be more resilient after disasters and things. 
um, there's a lot of work to be done. And you know, I'd like to say thanks to you and uh, folks like Chris Lee and, and Senator Gabbard. Uh, and, and I know that Senator um, Inouye now, uh, who took Senator Gabbard's place on the, on the Energy Committee, is uh, going to be super supportive too of the things that are moving forward with Mark Glick's office and, and my office to try and make uh, renewable energy and transportation, clean transportation a reality. But we uh, really appreciate the efforts that you make. And um, you and Chris Lee in particular impress me with some, you know, your young folks with a lot of energy, not an old fart like me with the kind of low energy and low T and everything else that, uh, you know, keep trying really hard to make things happen. But you guys have a, have the energy and the drive to make it work. And I, I admire you and I appreciate your help in the legislature uh, getting things done. And, you know, we'll try and do our part to educate and, and inform and keep doing things to, to move the technology along and make it more available to in our schools and in our community colleges and throughout our community. Uh, and we just appreciate uh, all the help that you give us along the way. Well, thank you. I that means a lot. I, uh, I, I really appreciate that. I'm sincere. And, yeah. you know, again, our 45 minutes is just blasted by like crazy. And, and you know how fast it goes because you've been in the seat before. But you know what it means, right? I'm going to have you back again sometime to talk more about this stuff because we, yeah, we still so. have more to talk about. Yeah, you wanted to talk about it next hour. We didn't get to it. Oh, yeah, well, okay. We'll, so. we'll, we'll let that take a pass I'll for now. I'll let Chris do it okay, you know, when okay. he comes to visit you. You telling time. me he can come on next time? I'll go and ask for you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Rep. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. And thanks for joining us today for Stan Energy Man and Rep. Keoho Kololei. How's that? Did I that do it right good. that time? Oh, it was yeah. perfect. Okay. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week, Friday. Aloha.